We're going to read verse 23 all the way through verse 10 of chapter 3, and I'm going to read through it quickly. So if you have your Bibles, uh, let's read that now, verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that as we have just read your word, that you would already now begin to reveal uh, things to us. Lord, open our minds, open our hearts. Help me as I share and speak to be clear. And Lord, this is all for your glory. We're reading your word. We're studying your word to glorify you so that we can learn about you. We thank you for your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. So we start this passage with these three verses that it's kind of a transition uh, paragraph, if you will, between Jesus cleansing the temple and this uh, conversation that Jesus has with this man named Nicodemus. And it reveals to us this, this idea and this truth, really, that Jesus knows what's in the heart of man. Now, man means mankind, humankind, right? Men and women. Jesus knows what is in each one of our hearts. From the beginning of time, he's known this. To any person who will come into this earth after this point in time, he knows what is in the heart of man. He's not surprised. He, he, he doesn't have to guess. God knows what's in our heart. There are times where we might not even know everything that God knows about us. There are things that we don't know about ourselves until, uh, for example, until we get married, and then we really realize how terrible human beings we can be, right? For those of you who are married, you think everything's good when you're single, and then you get married, and you, reveal, you, you realize you have a lot of work to do. Uh, but Jesus already knows our weaknesses. He knows our strengths. He knows what motivates us. He knows what our passions are. He knows what's in our heart. And we see here in, the, in, in these verses that Jesus, after the Passover, uh, it says that many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. And so he was doing more signs. He was doing more things that revealed that uh, he had power coming from some other source other than humanity. And people were believing when they saw these things. But Jesus knew why they were believing. And maybe some of them were believing for the wrong reasons. Jesus knew what was in their heart. And certainly he knows what's in the heart of this man who is coming to him at this time. And that's where we see in verse three, chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus has a visit from this man named Nicodemus. Now, 
Nicodemus, it says here, he was a Pharisee. And a Pharisee was a, an elite member of the Jews who was uh, someone who kept the law. And not only did they keep the law, but they loved the law of God. Now, the law I'm speaking about is the law of the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament law that was given by God to his chosen people, Israel. The Pharisees obviously were Jews who believed that they needed to, to obey the law. And it doesn't say this in the word of God, but tradition and Christian history would account that Nicodemus was most likely a member of the Sanhedrin, which was a high council position of the Jews. And the Sanhedrin were even above the Pharisees. Uh, they were Pharisees, but the, it was this elite group. If you think of, you can think of the Sanhedrin almost like the Senate of our government uh, and even maybe the Supreme Court of the way our government is structured today, that any kind of Jewish law or Jewish case that, would, that could not be settled in the lower court, if you will, would have to be raised up to the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus was, was most likely a part of this high council. And being a part of this high council, you had to have a zeal to obey every commandment of the Old Testament law. Every commandment. Judaism tradition if you count all of the Old Testament laws, you will arrive at the number 613. Okay? 613 Old Testament commandments. And to break that down further, we have 248 do's and 365 don'ts. So you have a don't for every day of the year. Every day you would have to not do 365 things and do 248 things to obey all of the commandments. So, in order to be committed to obeying these, you had to know them. These guys knew the entire Old Testament like the back of their hand. And so... They were so committed, and, and you can research this yourself, they, they were so committed to obeying these commandments that they would oftentimes create new commandments as safeguards to obey the original commandments, to not accidentally disobey one of the original Old Testament commandments, so they would invent new commands in order to obey the original commands. It, it would get out of control. And there are many Jews to this day who are stuck in this way of living. Thank God that uh, we live in the new covenant. Amen? So in verse 2, it says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him. So why did he come to Jesus by night? Well, I gather that he was possibly afraid to be seen questioning this man, Jesus. Because being a member of this elite council, to be having this dialogue about what he's about to talk to Jesus about would not look good for him, right? Why would this man of high council, this Pharisee, be going to this man named Jesus, who is kind of this radical new prophet on the scene, right? You have John the Baptist, who's crazy, pointing to Jesus, who is doing things that we've never seen done before, and, and whose name is he doing them? We don't know. He goes to the temple like it's his own house and starts cleaning it. What's, who is this guy? And so I can imagine that Nicodemus did not want to be seen having a conversation with Jesus. Now, I can't say that for a fact, but he is visiting Jesus at night. A lot of times you visit someone at night to do things in secret. So we see that he says this statement to Jesus in verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So 
first thing that we see here is that Nicodemus calls Jesus rabbi. Rabbi, of course, means teacher. It is a word for teacher. And this is Nicodemus acknowledging Jesus as a peer, right? He, he's acknowledging Jesus as a teacher, as uh, someone of authority of the word of God. This shows respect and even humility, which is kind of amazing being that Nicodemus was so high up uh, in the council of the Jews. And in verse 3, it says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly is a way of of saying sincerely, like I am, I am, sincerely giving you this information. And, and, you know, we would maybe say, listen, listen to what I'm going to tell you. This is, this is Jesus' tone in this uh, sentence that he says here. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is quite a statement. In fact, what does it even have to do with what Nicodemus asked Jesus or what, what he said to Jesus. You know, he's saying, I've seen these signs, which we read about in verse 23 through 25, that Jesus was doing more signs. So Nicodemus, Nicodemus had obviously seen some of these signs. He's saying, I can't explain this unless God is with you. Right? He, he's, he's pointing to Jesus as some kind of authority, right? Like he must have some kind of power. And he's mostly asking him about his power. Where where is he getting this power to do these things? How is he doing them? But Jesus is not really concerned about revealing that to Nicodemus. As we read about in my opening statement of this whole sermon was that Jesus knows what's in our heart. And he knows what's in Nicodemus' heart. He's not concerned about revealing to him how he performed these miracles. He's concerned about his soul. And so he says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus saying here? What, what, what does it mean to be born again? Now, for those of you who are born again, you, you don't need to really understand um, the Webster's Dictionary of that, the the meaning of that, because you have been born again. But for those of you who are are maybe not sure what this means, uh, let's let's look at at what this means. This this phrase, born again, has significant meaning for the believer today. Certainly Nicodemus didn't understand, so it seemed. So what does this mean? Well, in verse 4, Nicodemus says, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So obviously Nicodemus seems confused by this. You know, you can't enter your mother's womb a second time. Obviously, Jesus, what are you saying here? So Jesus tries to clarify for him. In verse 5, Jesus answers, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we see Jesus say born again. Now he says born of water and the Spirit. What is he saying here? Jesus is referring to an Old Testament passage in Ezekiel when he says, born of water and spirit. He's referring to this Old Testament passage in Ezekiel that had to do with cleansing and regeneration, spiritual cleansing and regeneration. Now remember, Nicodemus knew the Old Testament very well. He should have known what Jesus was referring to at this time. Otherwise, how can you obey all of the laws if you don't know the word of God, right? And so to get to where he was at this point, as high counsel, he would have had to know the Old Testament. 
And so Jesus is referring to this passage in Ezekiel, and, and I want to uh, turn there quickly. It's in Ezekiel 36, and we're going to read verses 25 through 27. And it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. This is Jesus giving uh, his word to the Israelites that he was going to birth in them his spirit uh, and cleanse them, right? I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from your uncleanness. I will put my spirit within you. This is what Jesus is referring to in this moment when he says, unless one is born of water in the spirit. I don't really think he's talking about being born of water in the natural, right? Being born in the womb and then being born in the spirit. Now, obviously, in order to be saved, you must obviously first be born, right? Uh, In the flesh. But this seems like kind of a redundant statement that it, it, it leads me to believe. And when you look, through the passage and examine the text that Jesus is referring to this passage of regeneration, of cleansing that can only be done by the Spirit. Being born again means means being born of the Spirit of Christ, right? Being rebirthed through the Holy Spirit in Christ. That is what being born again means. And Jesus is saying this is something only I can do. You cannot be born again in your own works. And when he says this to Nicodemus, I can just imagine his world beginning to crumble and fall apart. Jesus is basically telling him, your credentials of high counsel don't mean anything to me. They, they're nothing. You've, you've spent your whole life learning the law obeying the commands, uh, inventing new commands that the Jewish people have to obey in order to not disobey the original commands. You've been doing all of this in efforts to attain salvation, but none of that will save your soul. This is a work that only the Spirit can perform, only I can perform in the soul. And so Jesus was turning the theology of Nicodemus on its head. That theology that he could attain God through the law. And so in verse 6, we see that Jesus continues. He says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus is saying here that all men can produce All humanity can ever produce in themselves is sin, is carnality, is flesh. Because the heart of man, the heart of humanity is corrupt. This is exactly what Jesus is saying here. That if you are born of flesh, you cannot produce salvation That has to come from the Spirit. That has to come from regeneration from the Holy Spirit, right? When we we put our faith in Christ, it's His grace alone that saves us, right? It's, It's Him coming down to earth to us to meet us, right? We we've talked about this. Without Jesus coming to us, there's this separation, right? Between God and man. It is only through the birth of the Spirit, the new birth, can we be born again. There is nothing we can do ourselves to attain salvation. We are dead in our sins, dead in our unrighteousness, totally 
depraved, and corrupt. And the Word has something to say about this. So in Ephesians chapter 2, let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say. Ephesians 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's clear as day. When we were dead, Jesus saved us. Right? We were dead in our sin. But by God's grace alone, we have been saved. This is, this is really the greatest news because the Bible reveals to us our weakness, right? The Bible reveals to humanity the inability to overcome our sin on our own. We need a Savior. We need someone outside of humanity greater than, that has the power to redeem, and we have that in Christ through his Holy Spirit. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. It says here that no one seeks for God. Now, can we do good things in this world? Of course we can. Of course we can. In fact, we are called to produce good, good fruit. Amen? Amen. That's, that's the way that we uh, reveal Christ working through us in this world is through our, our production of the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Are we reflecting Christ? Are we re- reflecting Christ? the commandments of God. Can we do good works? Of course we can. But that is by no means how we obtain salvation. Salvation produces the good works. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans 8, 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Remember, Jesus said that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And then here in Romans 8, 7, it says the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. When we were dead in our sin before Christ transformed our lives, we were actually enemies of God. That is when Jesus died for us. Jesus didn't die for those that loved him. Jesus died for his enemies. And our hearts of flesh before Christ, before the rebirth of the Holy Spirit in in our lives, was hostile towards God. The heart of man is deceitful and sick. I'd like to read uh, an excerpt to you from a book that was written by my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather's name was Leonard Coote. Some of you may have heard of Leonard Coote. Um, He actually started Destiny Church, which is 80 years old this year. And before he started Destiny Church, he was fully running away from God. And there is a long story, a 
that goes along with Leonard Coote's life and his legacy and uh, his history of transformation and, and planting churches and being a missionary and the Lord uh, working miracles through his life time and time again. But this morning, I'd like to just read for you his transformation story. And it comes from a book that he wrote called Impossibilities Become Challenges. And just to give you a quick background, he was in Japan at the time, working at a secular job, living with a missionary uh, because he didn't want to be distracted with his work. And, and he knew that if he lived with a missionary, uh, the way he writes it in the book is that he would, he would not have to deal with uh, the temptations of, you know, going out and doing all that stuff. And so this missionary ends up trying to witness to him and share the word of God with him. Well, Leonard Coote takes it upon himself to read the Bible, to disprove the Bible, so that he could argue with this missionary and find fallacies in God's word to take it to the missionary and say, look, this is where God's word is wrong. Okay? So that's where we are at in this point of the story. And it says, Leonard Coote says, I did not read the book to find salvation, but to find the supposed inaccuracies I believed it contained. I began to read the Bible with a pencil in one hand and a notebook in the other, searching for mistakes. I began at Genesis, <clears throat> read through the five books of Moses, at times quite interested and at other times thinking it a dreary book. Then I came to Joshua, Judges, the two books of Samuel, the Kings, followed by Chronicles, right on until I came to Jeremiah. Without any noticeable conviction, I retired to my room after supper one night as usual and continued reading the Bible at the place I had left off the previous evening. As I read the words, quote, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. I was smitten. I saw myself as I had never seen myself before, a lost, undone, wicked, hell-bound sinner. It seemed as if my clothes smelt of the awfulness of sin Degradation was all around me, and the mouth of the pit was open wide to receive me, body, soul, and spirit. I could not do nothing. I, I, sorry, I could do nothing but fall on my face and call on God to save my soul. I was about to further humble myself by going outside to pray on the dirt in the backyard when something arrested and stilled my mind. It was possibly a vision. For I seemed to be beholding the cross and the five bleeding wounds of Calvary. The blood pouring out from every part of his body was presented to me. And in a few minutes, I seemed to understand this blood was for my sins. Though there was no audible voice, I heard the words distinctly saying, Coot, look and live. I did so. And deep down into my heart, was a stirring as if Jesus in very person was saying to me, I died thus for you. I shed my blood for your sins. Just accept my work of redemption. I did so crying out, I believe, I believe. An inward peace now settled over my soul and I continued to prostrate myself before God in silence. When suddenly the floodgates of my soul were opened, joy rushed in and I knew no bounds. Joy flooded my being as I realized that I had now been converted. My sins were washed away, and now I was a child of God. Everything was different. God had totally transformed Leonard Coote. It was nothing that Leonard Coote did. In fact, he was reading God's word for all the wrong reasons. Just like Nicodemus was living for the law for all the wrong reasons. He was trying to attain his salvation. Leonard Coote was reading the word to disprove God entirely. But yet when the Holy Spirit draws man to himself, when God reveals himself to us, 
What can we do but submit to the Lord in faith? And this is the account that Leonard Coote had, that God visited him and he was born again in spirit through Christ. But apart from this new birth, this is the state of our humanity. From being born again in the spirit, this this is the state of humanity. In verse 7, chapter 3 of of our passage today, Jesus says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus is it's kind of chiding uh, Nicodemus here. Do not marvel because Nicodemus knows the law. He, he knows the Old Testament. He knows the promises of God to uh, bring the Israelites, the people, to a spiritual renewal, right? Through the cleansing of the Spirit. And so he says, you must be born again. And then in verse 8, we see the power that can only come from the Spirit. It says, the wind blows where it wishes. This is Jesus talking. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus gives this comparison of wind to the Holy Spirit. Now, what is it about wind that is so amazing? Well, one is its power, right? How many of you have experienced the power of wind, right? We probably all have at one point in our lives or, 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 or seen its power at work. We've also seen how wind can be very gentle, right? We can feel the cool breeze of the wind. It can be very subtle. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit can move, you know, uh, in a very subtle way, and it can move in a very powerful way. We can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. Another characteristic of the wind is that it does what it wants to do, right? We cannot control the wind, right? We cannot control the direction of the wind, no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try. If I held a class here on how to control the wind, how many of you would attend? Nobody. In fact, you'd probably leave the church. Uh, I would. (laughs) I would leave. You cannot control the wind, and so it is with the Holy Spirit. We cannot control the working of the Spirit. We can be in line with the working of the Holy Spirit as God's people, But Jesus is saying here that I am the one who does the work. My spirit comes alive in the believer, in the repentant heart, that as we we seek the Lord, right, as we are in his word, as Leonard Coote was, he was in the word for the wrong reason, but yet he was reading the word and the Holy Spirit convicted his heart when he came to the passage in Jeremiah. Because this, this word is alive. This word is alive. You can have wrong intentions when reading this book and still be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Because the words are alive and powerful. Because why? Because every word in this, in this book was breathed by who? God, the Holy Spirit. Right? The word attests to itself in that way that it is alive, that it is the Holy Spirit working through the pages on this book. And so is the Holy Spirit at work in salvation. It is only the work that Jesus can do. We can do nothing to attain our salvation. In verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Nicodemus is still not getting it. Maybe he's getting it and he's just, his mind is just kind of exploding because remember up until this point, he was doing everything he could to obey the law. And here Jesus is, Nicodemus didn't even ask for how to be saved. Jesus is just 
dumping this truth on him that, hey, you're doing all this for nothing. None of what you do, none of your worldview is going to save you from your sins. Only a work of the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 10, Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Nicodemus did not understand. And if we are not careful, if we are just trying to do good works, we are not going to, that, that is not what saves us. And so when we are witnessing to people or when we see someone in their sin or when we see someone living a lifestyle of sin, our first response should not be, what's wrong with that person? Our first response should not be, I do not like that person. I cannot stand what they are doing. Our first response should be, they need a work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Our first response should be, I need to pray for that person that God would reveal himself to to that person. I need to pray that God would help me to witness to that person, to share the word of God with that person so that the Holy Spirit can change the heart of that person. Because without the heart change, the works, the good works will not come. And the flip side of that, doing good works will not save you. There are people today living, uh, they, they, they don't want to believe, they don't want to submit their lives to Christ, but they obey the commandments of the Bible in order to earn their salvation. I'm telling you, that is not how you are saved. You are saved through your faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit transforms you, regenerates you, makes you clean through the grace of God. Christ alone is what saves us. Let's pray. Lord, you are our Savior. You are our King. Help us to see that it is, it is only a work of your Spirit that, that saves the soul. Being born again means that we are transformed from the inside out through the Holy Spirit working in us. Lord, we thank you, thank you, thank you that you loved us so much that even while we were enemies of you, you died for us. You hung on the cross, took our sin on yourself so that we can be saved. When we put our faith in you, when we repent and turn, Lord, your spirit saves us. And we are born again. We thank you for new life in you, that we are new creations through Christ. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.